Welcome everybody to a new session of the Epidemic Ethics uh, Seminar. This is a WHO initiative in collaboration with the Global Health Network. The topic for today's session is adapting ethics review during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Carla Sainz, I'm the Regional Bioethics Advisor at the Pan American Health Organization, which is WHO's regional office for the Americas. I'm delighted to, to chair this session uh, on a crucial topic uh, for a public health emergency. As we all know, research is critical during a public health emergency, like the COVID-19 uh, emergency. And research must be conducted quickly, but it must be conducted ethically in all cases. And that means that research with human subjects must always obtain prior ethics uh, approval by a committee before starting. But that poses a challenge. Committees need to adapt the way they do their work in order to be able to review and oversee studies uh, um, in a timely and appropriate way during an emergency. Um, before introducing our great panelists today, I just want to say uh, how important this topic is. As you well know, this is a topic that we have uh, uh, discussed widely during the pandemic, the initial, the initial part of the pandemic, but it's still a very timely uh, uh, topic. And it's timely because when we talk about adapting the process of committees, it's not a one-time effort. We've learned that this is not a hundred meter race, this is a marathon. So we have to learn to adjust and adjust and adjust. So even if we've done the work before, we need to continue doing it. Also, we've learned that the oversight of research during the pandemic has been extremely difficult because of all the big volume of research being produced during the pandemic. And we also find the need to start looking ahead and uh, to reflect what could have done and should have done better and what we should do to be better prepared uh, for a new emergency. We have a number of, of lessons uh, to learn for future emer emergencies, but perhaps we have lessons to learn also for the standard way committees work. Perhaps some, some adaptations are, are here to stay and not exclusively in the context of an emergency. So we'll be discussing this great topic with you today. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, uh, to, to have a great panel for this uh, discussion. We'll start today with Dr. Maureen Kelly. She's the Professor of Bioethics and Welcome Senior Investigator at the Ethics Center and the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities at the University of Oxford. Maureen specializes in ethics and women's and children's global health and international research ethics. And she also serves as a member of the COVID-19 Research Ethics Committee for the, the WHO. After, uh, after Maureen's uh, presentation, we'll have Dr. Raleigh Mathur, who is the head of the Indian Council of Medical Research Bioethics Unit based in Bengaluru, uh, India, uh, which is a WHO collaborating center for bioethics and has published national guidelines for this topic early in the pandemic. Rowley is also the nodal office for the Department of Health Research National Ethics Committee Registry, and she's the member secretary of the National Ethics Committee at ICMR. She's also a member of the WHO Ethics and COVID Working Group. Uh, the, our last panelist will be Dr. Rafaela Ravinetto, who is a senior researcher at the Public Health Department at the Antwerp Institute of Tropical Medicine, where she's in charge of a portfolio of research, policy support, networking, and advocacy on medicines in low and middle income countries. She also chairs the, their, uh, the institution's institutional review board and the ethics review board of Doctors Without Borders, MSF. It's great to be with you today. Please, uh, uh, um, uh, Professor uh, um, Maureen Kelly, please start with your uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. And um, 
thank you very much to the organizers for the for the kind invitation. Um, it was really wonderful to join this panel and I look forward to learning from the other panelists. And thanks to participants for the excellent questions. Um, we clearly need a three hour session to answer all of them, but thank you for sending us through and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, by way of background, as Carla mentioned, I serve on the ad hoc COVID-19 um, ethics committee, ethics review committee for the WHO. And I've worked for about 15 years in various roles as either chair or member of IRBs and research ethics committees and DSMBs, which I'll speak about um, in some of my comments. My views today are my own, my own views, so I'm not representing WHO in my opinions. Um, really interesting time to have this session because we're by no means out of, out of the fray. We're very much in the, in the thick of the pandemic in most of the world, as we see in India in particular. So um, I think it's useful to take stock, but we are all actively working and reviewing and scientists are actively trying to, to find um, better treatments and vaccines. So I, I think it's important uh, to continue to reflect, but we're very much in the mode of, of acting, I think both as scientists and as research ethics experts. Um, so while it's too early to speak of definitive lessons learned from COVID-19, um, what I'd like to do is share four reflection points on um, sort of heightened issues that, that have come up so far uh, in the course of reviewing uh, large scale studies that have come through the WHO. Um, so I'll be speaking mostly from, from that perspective. And I think there's some live lessons learned um, that we can start to think about. And as Carla said, some of these adaptations may be here to stay. So I think some of the pressure points uh, from the pandemic have revealed weaknesses and that we were all very familiar with and how we can efficiently uh, review complex international research trials and do so by the highest ethical standards. Um, so I think one of the important reflection points, and Carla mentioned this briefly, is that we've seen how research is an absolutely critical and integral part of the pandemic response. Um, and I would say this is true of isolated or regional outbreaks as well. So we have seen with Zika, Ebola, loss of fever, that we, um, we absolutely need to think of research uh, as, as critical. And so uh, we therefore need to think about efficient, um, rigorous ethical review as part of that process as well, that the two go hand in hand. So it's very much been a success story for science, I think. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to say it's been a success story for research ethics as well, because behind every one of those large scale complicated trials has been an ethics committee working very hard to try to get critical feedback quickly and efficiently. Um, but I'm well aware that there have been challenges and frustrations. Um, so many of the lessons learned um, will have to do with governance and that's not at all surprising. Um, and I know two of the other panelists will be speaking to some of these issues. So I just briefly wanted to say that um, I think this, this question of global coordination and authority, particularly between national and in international bodies in ethics review is a critical uh, choke point. Uh, it's, it's one of the biggest frustrations for scientists and actually for research ethics reviewers as well um, is the time spent on bureaucracy, the time spent on documentation and figuring out sort of the lines of authority with different governing bodies. So I think the remains, and again, these were, these were known issues um, and challenges and they're just heightened during a pandemic. So improving coordination, improving or getting rid of redundancies between committees and thinking really seriously about models of using an ERC of record or a regional ERC as opposed to five ERCs uh, in the country plus the international governance. Um, so I think those questions are very difficult, thorny. We were familiar with them before this pandemic and uh, we, need, we, we need to really work on those governance challenges. Uh, second point is that as science adapts to um, become more nimble in responding to an outbreak, research ethics needs to do the same. So we've seen the rise of adaptive trial designs and I don't think as research ethics committees, we are up to 
snuff in terms of um, really having the expertise to review adaptive trial designs. Uh, some of us are trying to get there quickly and it's, a, it's an emerging area of research ethics and there is emerging discussion around how to review adaptive trial designs. But I think that this is going to be one of the kind of key learning points out of um, COVID-19 and research ethics review. One of the um, insights I think that has come out of trying to think about how we should review adaptive trial designs is the important role of the DSNB. So again, it's slightly a governance issue, but I think thinking about the transition and continuity of ethics oversight um, beyond the initial thinking about how we can build our DSMBs to include ethics expertise. So that's increasingly the case. Uh, we're increasingly including a research ethicist on many DSMBs, data safety monitoring boards. Um, but I think that this is something particularly for the adaptive designs that's really valuable. And that would then take some of the pressure off of that initial review where we may not have full information about the different drugs that might be or the different arms that might be included in the adaptive design. Um, third reflection point is just about the need to shift the culture in research ethics from one of, um, maybe this is a perception, but one of sort of bureaucratic or punitive um, processes to one of collaboration and support. Easier said than done. Every committee has its own ethos and its own culture. And I have worked on, on committees where um, it's very supportive and there's a lot of back and forth between scientists and the committee. Um, and where the, you know, the, the level of bureaucracy is, is low um, and others where that's not the case. So I, I know there's huge variation, but I, I think that that's such a, a, a critical issue um, in the perception of, of research ethics committees, but also in their actual day-to-day -day function. Um, being able to just invite scientists to come speak to the committee in an in a, in a open way so that we can talk through some of the challenges um, and I think there's a lot to learn from the research ethics consult model. Uh, there has been kind of a firewall between formal research ethics review and research ethics consultation, where you might have an embedded research ethicist on an ongoing trial, or you might get advice um, for a, a trial network, for example, and that's treated as separate from the formal research ethics review process. It would be nice if, those weren't quite as separate. And I know that raises governance challenges, but um, it, it just, I've seen the, the ease with which when to open up the conversations with scientists as they're working on a protocol, as they're starting to think about recruitment and issues of inclusion, that it's just, it's such a, uh, it's a much more productive uh, conversation and exchange to have more open lines of communication and sort of less formality. So if there were ways in which ERCs could adopt um, some of the um, ways of communicating and processes that we use in research ethics consultation, I think that that's something worth looking into. And uh, my last reflection is on the substantive ethical issues. So as Carla really importantly said, um, our starting point for research ethics review in a pandemic needs to be how do we um, foster a rapid uh, research response and uphold the highest standards of, of research ethics. But what I, I think we can talk about is what are the heightened ethical issues that we as research ethics committees really need to have sort of a laser focus on. And um, there are several, and I hope we can bring some of these out further in discussion. But the first is I think uh, this issue of social value, the research really needs to have social value in the pandemic. Um, is this going to be helping to reduce suffering? Will this be helping to find an intervention? Is this something that could wait and be done later? Um, so I think that we have as a committee have had a lot of focus on the social value of research in a very sort of contextual sense. Um, the second, we've learned from the pandemic that those who are vulnerable um, at the baseline are doubly or triply so in the pandemic. Um, so the usual questions and concerns around vulnerable populations are all the more important. And so what we want to see in study designs is an eye to how those will be managed. And this importantly includes frontline research staff. Um, so Patricia Kangori has done important work on this, uh, but 
we oftentimes don't think about the impact on frontline research staff, and this has come up in the pandemic um, in a huge way. Um, is PPE available? Uh, are they being, uh, is their task shifting? Are they being taken away from really important clinical tasks in responding to the pandemic because we've got a research trial there? Um, and last is the issue of unfair exclusion of designated special uh, populations or vulnerable populations. So the issues with pregnant women have really uh, been brought to the fore with the pandemic. The default very quickly moved back to exclusion because it was just too difficult to go through the approval process for including pregnant women. Um, the effect and the delay on having vaccines that are proven safe uh, during pregnancy. So I'll stop there and give the other panelists a chance to, to chime in and hopefully we can come back around to some of these points during discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maureen. Dr. Raleigh Mathur, please uh, share your, your uh, remarks with us. Thank you very much, uh, Carla. Uh, I have a few slides and I thought that would help us, uh, uh, help me share my uh, you know, thoughts with you better. So uh, let us look at how uh, India has adopted its ethics review processes during the pandemic. So uh, this is just a background that we do have a structure where we have a central ethics committee at the ICMR level, which serves as a national committee. And then there are institutional level ethics committees. There are independent ethics committees. And some institutions have tried to do common uh, reviews and have common joint ethics committees are there. Uh, all ethics committees in India are required to register with the central licensing authorities. So for clinical trials, so those ethics committees that review clinical trials, they have to register with CDSEO and the ones that review biomedical health research have to re uh, register with the uh, Department of Health Research. And also CTRI registration of every uh, clinical trial is mandated by law. However, in the new guidelines that ICMR came up, uh, it was suggested as a good practice that all COVID-19 related research should also be registered voluntarily on the CTRI platform. And we also have a national accreditation system for ethics committees in India. So these are the publications that became very important for us that came out, uh, some of these came out during the pandemic. So of course we had our national guidelines which came out in 17, which had a section uh, on epidemics and humanitarian emergencies and research during that time. So it had uh, briefly addressed this issue, but when the pandemic actually struck us, we realized that we needed a much detailed guidelines and therefore the national guidelines for ethics committees were developed very quickly and released in April, 2020. And uh, these have been actually downloaded in more than 45 countries from our website. So we feel very happy to, uh, about that. And also ICMR came up with the SOP template because as we heard of a previous speaker that you know, the ethics committees did not have a way of carrying out an emergency review. So we felt that there is a need to develop a SOP which could be adopted by any ethics committee and uh, you know, to suit their own requirements. So this was done. And another important initiative that was earlier initiative was preparation of submission forms. So this is a common form that was prepared uh, earlier in 18, but this was very useful during the pandemic for ethics committee functioning because uh, during the pandemic, what was needed was an ethics committee in order to do an, you know, quick review, an expeditious review and a robust review needed to have full and complete information that is submitted by the PI. So use of this form, which dealt with, you know, not only initial review, but also talked about continuing review, expedited review, exemption from review, it had CV formats, it had adverse event reporting formats, special forms for research involving genetic studies or epidemiological research. Uh, so it had all these forms which were very useful during this time because these were able to ask the right questions from the researcher and the researchers were able to address those questions which usually the ethics committee would ask and that delays uh, time you know, in the approval process. Now this looks like a very busy slide, but I'll just quickly highlight some of the points that were there in the new guidelines um, for ethics committee developed you for the COVID-19 pandemic. So the guidelines said that, you know, the ethics committee have to reduce their timelines and have more frequent meetings. 
they have to move on to the digital meeting platforms have virtual meetings they need to have shorter agendas instead of having very long meetings they could have shorter meetings shorter agendas address the issues of science as well as ethics because without good science there won't be good ethics and also try to involve as many subject experts so that you could do a robust scientific review invite independent consultants to give advice uh, on an opinion on various protocols have uh, representation from participants and patient communities public to join in the meeting and it was very easy to do so because of the virtual platform so we could uh, you know have people coming in and joining in from all parts of the country without having to physically travel and have alternate members of ethics committees appointed so that for example to fulfill the quorum if a particular member is not available and you have to you want to do a meeting in the next 24 hours it was very good when if you had an alternate member available who was a voting member for the committee a common review of multi center research was another good suggestion it was followed in many uh, many studies where large multi centric studies were centrally reviewed and then uh, the local issues were looked at by the local ethics committees conflicts of interest management was suggested in the guidelines and adopting to newer methodology technologies adaptive designs be open to these new ideas was a suggestion in the guidelines having monitoring mechanism in place collaboration encouraging collaboration sharing looking at increased vulnerabilities and also safety of healthcare workers while reviewing the research was an important suggestion engaging with community and looking at aspects of payments and compensation payment in case of research related injury and benefit sharing after the research is over these were other suggestions psychosocial and mental health being an important topic was also suggested that ethics committee members need to look into those aspects if there is a transfer of biological material or data sets that needed uh, some attention also preventing infodemic a new term that was coined at that time by who and also responsible reporting by media was suggested good research governance frameworks and finally building trust and ensuring safety and well-being of uh, participant rights so with that the central ethics committee at icmr which serves as a national committee was able to rapidly respond and do robust review of all kinds of research whether it was clinical trials or socio behavioral research zero surveys and many other types of research uh, we had several full committee meetings and also a number of expedited review committee meetings where the average turnaround time was only between 24 to 72 hours with a shorter agenda one to three items and duration of the meeting ranging from one to three hours now this is a, a bit of unpublished information which i am happy to share with you all and this is a study we have just completed it was sponsored it was an international survey uh, uh, in looking at how ethics committees responded to these challenges it was sponsored by who and coordinated by the good uh, clinical practice alliance of uh, europe and in india it was conducted by us uh, more than 90 countries have actually participated in this uh, survey uh, so uh, the, to the question that how the ethics committees were able to adapt their meetings and procedures during the covid-19 pandemic we found that the majority uh, you know almost 70% said uh, ethics committee had self evaluated themselves saying that you know they did well and in fact uh, about 20% said above their expectations so they were able to meet up these challenges and when you look at the methods of adaptation that they involved you see that they adopted to virtual meetings and you know um, having the uh, accelerated uh, review timelines then they had uh, sops that address specific issues to public health uh you know emergencies and new formats and other such examples have been given uh some of the other questions were like you know, about community engagement we found that that was not really done the way we would have liked it to be um, about 55% said no that uh, you know they were not able to engage with the community in the design and conduct uh but uh, about considering whether uh, medical researchers and healthcare workers were vulnerable and needed special protection an overwhelming number of 75% said yes to that did the ethics committee approve or recommend use of electronic consent again about 60% said yes to that uh, and did the ec feel pressured by others you know sponsors or our organizations in view of the review so basically about conflict of interest there was again an overwhelming number about 71.5% who said no 
but there were um, another you know 20 percent who said who skipped the question and about seven percent who did said yes to that so these are some of the important findings we have much more data to share actually uh, and on some other platform but uh, we realize that what the important points were that you know the ethics committee needs to be facilitated they have to support research good research they have to be facilitatory they have to be adaptive to the new requirements in order to conduct a robust review be responsive in a timely manner and to ensure quality of uh, their review processes with that i'd like to thank uh, all the attendees and as well as who for giving me this opportunity to speak here today thank you very much thank you so much rolly for sharing that great experience uh, with us and I want to welcome our third uh, panelist, Dr. Rafaela Ravinetto. I would like to compliment the excellent presentation from the other colleagues with the perspective uh, from uh, the Institute of Tropical Medicines uh, IRB. We are uh, uh, an ethics committee located in the global north, which uh, review a big majority of collaborative research in, uh, in global health. And uh, I'm also uh, echoing the experience of the ethics review board of uh, MSF, which has clearly a direct perspective on uh, research in the humanitarian field. Uh, well, first, a bit of numbers. Last year, our IRB at the Tropical Institute was literally overwhelmed with work. On the top of the routine, we have a small uh, ethics committee. We had uh, 39 COVID submission in expedited mode. And the expedited mode means that uh, we should uh, deliver our review within uh, four days. So that's really uh, a kind of challenge. We managed to survive it, also increasing uh, ad hoc the number of the of the ethics reviewer, but really just keeping up with this kind of prolonged uh, emergency is a challenge for, uh, for an ethics committee, especially if we consider what Carla had said in the beginning, that an epidemic on a public health emergency is not a reason to, to relax the ethics uh, uh, oversight. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a situation of uh, emergency can uh, exacerbate uh, the, the vulnerability of people and populations. So we, we must perhaps be even more vigilant. Apart from uh, the timelines and the stress from all this workload, another um, major challenge that we faced is the one that Maureen uh, mentioned before, checking the social value of the research. This is something you always, always have to do, but in the specific case of COVID, there was so much research. There were so many uh, publication coming in the public domain, including uh, preprints. We have never seen so many preprints uh, becoming public before the peer-reviewed publication. So sometimes it was really, a challenge to try to understand is this the, uh, relevant, uh, is this pertinent, is it redundant versus other research because of this overflow of information. Uh, we had uh, difficulties, of course, assessing this aspect in, uh, in clinical research, particularly when I work with uh, repurposed medicine, but we also have uh, the challenge of assessing the, the, the risk safety, uh, of doing the risk assessment for non-clinical research, also in epidemiological research, also in social science research, you may have risks which are not strictly medical, but which have uh, risks, uh, psychological risks, uh, serious risks to privacy, to stigmatization, and that's not always that easy uh, to assess, particularly when research is done in very vulnerable population, um, for instance, old people in the treat house. So uh, these are challenges. And another one that I would like to mention is the fact that often research, particularly epidemiological research related to COVID was a little bit on the, in, the, in a gray area. 
between research and uh, public health surveillance. So sometimes researchers didn't know exactly if they should come for ethics reviews. Sometimes we were ourselves uncertain where this kind of research is public health surveillance or it is research in itself. Often we try to explain, to discuss with the researcher and uh, we said sometimes you may not need a formal review from a research at this committee because it is not still, it is not research, but you still have ethics issue, even if this is not formally research, protection of privacy and confidentiality, attention for the risk of stigmatization, uh, uh, informed consent, this remain important. So sometimes we had exchange it with the researcher, we discuss to discuss about this ethics issue, perhaps it shouldn't have been our role, but there is not another body which would advise them. So this was also a big part of the work. Um, if we come to the contents of the review, I think that really the emerging themes on which we have almost systematically raise comments or requests for clarification are very much linked to the to the NAFID, NAFID Council report of 2020. We often raise question about uh, uh, collaborative partnership. Uh, we asked to explicit to be more explicit on how uh, collaborative partnerships, particularly with the research in the South, were uh, built in a fair way. We always uh, often ask the more explicit plans for community engagement, uh, sometimes also asking whether there was a budget line to, uh, to, to carry out these activities. And we often had to ask for clarification about the, the plans for further data sharing and the samples biobanking. And we are aware that it can be difficult for the researchers in emergency to have clear plans for community engagement or for data sharing or bio bankings, but yeah, we think that these are very, um, very sensitive, very delicate issues uh, related to protection of participants and communities. So we asked to discuss at least preliminary uh, plans. And I think this was more or, less, more or less the shortest overview that I could uh, have done. I would just, Add to add one more point, which is also linked to something which was mentioned by Maureen, what I missed during, uh, and what I'm still missing uh, when I'm uh, reviewing uh, a research related to COVID-19 is more peer discussion with uh, other ethics committee. Sometimes we know that the same ethics committee in the North, in the South, in different countries assessing the same protocol, and it would be really nice to have the time and the opportunity for an exchange on the respective comments to learn to it from each other, to be uh, to become complementary. And unfortunately, there is traditionally there has not been much support for ethics committee to come together. And uh, I think this is something that should be addressed in the in the middle term. And, uh, and thanks a lot for uh, for your kind attention. It was it was great to join Sai, such a high qualified uh, panel. Thank you so much, uh, Rafaela, for sharing those uh, thoughts uh, with us. I think that the four, the, the three panelists have given us so much uh, uh, food for thought and reflection. I want to start by uh, uh, with one very uh, specific question that, ha that has been asked that to some extent has been answered already, but I think it's very, it's an issue, it's very important to be clear about. Can ethics review be bypassed uh, for biomedical research in an emergency situation? All of you, please, just one by one. Uh, no. <laughs> is that enough? Uh, no, I, I think the question is, I appreciate the question um, and where it comes from. I think the question is how to um, become more efficient in, in our ethics review. Um, and the question is not whether it should be bypassed, um, but whether we can do it better and more quickly while maintaining the, the rigor. 
Well, on my side, I can only agree with uh, Maureen, and I think that there is a mutual responsibility to try to make the, the review as rapid as possible. Uh, on the one hand, the researchers should try to present submission which, has, which are as complete as possible, despite the stress. And on the other side, the research at this committee should have a mechanism in place for uh, expedited review with some uh, public accountability on uh, the deadline that uh, we commit to, to comply with when there is a, uh, an emergency like that. Uh, delaying uh, uh, pertinent uh, research is unethical, like it is unethical doing an unethical research. <laughs> so we have to, to, to combine the two, uh, the two uh, needs. And in continuation of uh, previous speakers, the question to this question is why? Why would somebody want to bypass the ethics review? That's the question actually. So as per my understanding, this question arises only when the ethics committees are not able to deliver in time. So that's why the researchers would like to bypass and they find that uh, you know, the ethics committees are delaying my research. So if we can find ways and mechanisms to strengthen the work of the ethics committee, and there are no reasons for delay at their end. The ethics committees uh, have good secretariat, their offices, they have meetings which are frequently done. They are able to do a robust review. They are able to train their members, uh, have full-time secretariat. I think that is one challenge because ethics committees don't have full support. They are all honorary kind of committees who are working in institutions at least in India, and um, therefore they do not, uh, because they are, uh, they have a primary work uh, in some other department and ethics is one of the part-time work that they have to do. So because of all this, the, uh, the general, uh, you know, there is a lack of communication between researchers and ethics committees, and that is what uh, has to be uh, improved. And uh, if ethics committees are doing good jobs, I don't think this question arises. Thank you. Thank you. Uh to the three of you, because uh, the, the point you've made tied nicely to another question that we have received, which is taking into account how busy, how overburdened committees are, what specific measures can we consider to ease their stress, to make the, the burden the, the, uh, uh, of dealing with this amount of work quickly easier uh, uh, to handle and actually expedite the review processes while ensuring that they conduct a rigorous review. You want to start, Raleigh? Go for it. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think I did address the issue in my presentation as well, that uh, some of the lessons that we have learned to carry forward and uh, the new normal that is, is one is the using the common form for ethics committees has been very useful, which has to simplify and harmonize the ethics committee submission and helps the researcher address the ethical aspects. So uh, that is a one important lesson for us. Then prior review by an ethics committee secretariat using the checklists and tools that are available to look at completeness, categorizing the research into exempt or expedited or full review categories, uh, rather than you know, taking everything to the next meeting, uh, waiting for the, uh, you know, a meeting to happen, engaging with more subject experts, having prior scientific review done, calling in independent consultants, having patient representatives on board, alternate members of ethics committee, these are all very useful things. And also digital platform, as I said, is a new normal, it saves our carbon footprint and uh, also encouraging electronic methods of informed consent process and recording and moving away from paper is uh, some of the learnings from this pandemic. Thank you. Rafaela, Maureen, I don't know if you want to add anything to this uh, issue of the specific measures that committees could take to make the work. I think I fully agree with uh, Rolly. What I could perhaps complement is that at the at this committee must, must really become flexible. So we have rules, but under these uh, circumstances, we should be ready to have either the secret secretariat or the chair to be easily available by phone with the researchers who can uh, tell you, as up, we are sending a, a submission uh, 
in a few days so we can start to, <laughs> to reserve the reviewers. Uh, we may be uh, open to talk much more to the researchers and to solve out uh, disagreements uh, by speaking to each other in a dialogue and not by, by email. And uh, also some, some at this committee, like uh, the one of IRB, which at the, at the Tropical Institute, which is a small one, we try to get new members on board. And this is linked to a kind of ethics culture, ethics institutional cultures. I think if research ethics is important for a research institution, this should also be translated in having many people who are interested in being part of an institutional review board, which is also an opportunity to learn, to contribute to this ethical approach. So this is also something to be worked at within an institution at a broader level, to get this culture where everybody, including the coach of future researchers, are aware of the importance of these ethics value aspects. Thank you, Rafaela. Maureen, please. Yes, no, I think Rafaela and Rolly have, have really captured a number of practical things that we could do differently. Sustainability is a huge issue um, day to day, even without a pandemic. And I just wanted to, to point out the elephant in the room, which is it's serving on the Research Ethics Committee is almost always service. Um, it's often uncompensated. And during the pandemic, it's like having a second full-time job. Um, so while the scientists have been working flat out, uh, the clinicians on the front lines, um, the research ethics uh, teams have been as well, often sort of hidden um, in the fray. And, and I do think that um, thinking at an institutional level, especially for institutions in the global south and in low resourced universities, how do we, find the resources to better support um, training for increasing the numbers of members on a, on a team that can rotate in as Raleigh suggested um, and just having a, a larger team that you can draw on uh, with the expertise needed to review very complex studies. For example, I mentioned the challenges of adaptive trial designs. We really need you know, capable, uh, well-trained staff, but we also need some support. Uh, it's really quite time consuming. And again, colleagues uh, in less resourced universities, I know really struggle with the amount of time um, that they're putting in in addition to their full-time uh, job, often, often as service over and above um, their regular commitments. Thank you, Rolly. I think that is a very important addition because it is indeed the elephant in the room. We want something, but we want it, we want it quickly and we want it for free and good quality too. So perhaps we should be thinking about different ways uh, uh, to ensure that that happens. So there's an, a, a great question that relates to many of these uh, uh, conversations. We've talked a lot about collaborations. We said we need to collaborate, we need to cooperate. Committees need to coordinate, they need to collaborate among themselves. We need to, not just within one country, but also between different countries, regionally, North and South. What uh, are your thoughts uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, proposals to foster and support collaboration and hopefully also institutionalize uh, collaboration, at least in emergencies between different uh, research ethics committees? I don't know who of you wants to uh, uh, start. Just unmute yourself. Well, uh, maybe I can start. It's a great question, Carla. And I think there's a lot to desire for, I mean, in terms of collaboration between the ethics committees. As of now, I don't see we have a structure where ethics committees talk to each other. We don't have, uh, uh, you know, we do talk through researchers. So when even when a common review is being done by the ethics committee, it is only through the researchers that the ethics committee uh, gets to know what is happening around. So uh, this is a challenge and I think uh, we need to work more on this uh, area. I, I don't have experience of uh, collaboration between the ethics committees. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rolly. Go, Rafaela, please. 
uh, as usual, it's difficult to talk after Rolly because she has given a very good <laughs> overview. And uh, I was trying to think of any experience, because during the Ebola crisis, for instance, there was a lot of discussion. We should get this collaboration, a collaborative and exchange platform, but eventually it was not done. I think that many years ago, the DNDI made something uh, very interesting. They brought together once representative of the different ethics committee, which would have assessed the clinical trial for the development of fexinidazole for sleeping sickness. It was a good experience because each ethics committee still take its decision alone, but there was this preliminary uh, peer discussion which helped to frame uh, ethical challenges uh, together. I think we should plan this before the next emergencies. During the emergencies, we are overwhelmed with the day-to-day. -day. So this is, should be really part of the next research <laughs> preparedness. Uh, and there are some mechanisms. Uh, ADCTP has uh, a call every year for uh, funding uh, the strengthening of uh, research ethics committee. So perhaps some external funding should be looked for this by group of countries, group of healthy committee, but it should be part of the research preparedness. I don't think we will ever be able to organize this when we are in the midst of the, of the emergency. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Rafaela. I think... Uh, Another important issue that we've experienced during, uh, during the pandemic is not just the review, but the oversight of research that's being conducted. So uh, what are your, your, uh, your suggestions for committees to conduct an adequate oversight of, uh, of studies uh, of ongoing studies, given the limitations of the, uh, that they encountered in the context of, of the pandemic. I'm in happy to, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to kick off on this one. Um, as I mentioned, I think we, we ought to be thinking about more continuity between the initial research ethics review by the ERC and um, handoffs with the DS and BE. So they're separate entities, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. They're not used in all studies. Um, they, they've typically been used for complex or potentially high risk clinical trials. Um, could we use them more regularly? And could we increase the, um, uh, could we embed ethicists on those committees? Uh, that is becoming the case in a, in a lot of studies where there's an ethicist on the DSMB. Um, so I think that that's something to look at because, um, so we did a, a large international study looking at the post-approval space and ongoing um, clinical studies and the types of ethical challenges that come up and really found that once you've had the ethics review that study teams are really on their own for handling dilemmas in the field. So I think this question of um, ongoing, not just oversight, but ongoing support for the kinds of ethical challenges that you just can't anticipate at the time of review, that, that there's enormous need, um, again, for support as well as oversight. And that's something I, I think is worth looking at in terms of um, possible structures. And the, we already have a DSMB structure in place, so could we somehow use that uh, and or research consultation or research ethics support um, embedded in, in research studies. Um, all of those would be worth looking at, but would require um, support, obviously, financing. Yes, thank you, Maureen. I, um, I, we posted at some point in the chat the document that Pajo produced on uh, ethics oversight on ongoing research, and I want to, uh, uh, I'm referring to that because I want to relate to an issue that uh, uh, some of you brought up in your presentations, which is social value, and uh, and some uh, um, some persons uh, uh, presenting questions have also referred to the the challenge of ensuring that studies have a scientific validity, scientific validity, and so it is 
with the huge production of research, one thing that happens is that studies that did have social values or, or that had the potential of benefiting uh, 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 health and, and, and well-being when they were reviewed lost social value during the study or a, a, a scientific design that we thought was uh, was ethically acceptable will be was no longer ethically acceptable later in the study because we uh, uh, we found out, for example, that one arm had certain was too risky or or didn't yield any benefit. So, any thoughts about that component that continues reassessment to ensure that uh, that studies that were initially deemed ethical continue being ethical uh, uh, in the context in which so much research is being produced. try to answer the difficult question. See, monitoring of research has always been challenging for an ethics committee because for a long time, several years, an ethics review has been considered like a one-time event of reviewing, approving, and that's it. And there was no concept of having continuing review reports or even an annual report or a final report being submitted to the ethics committee. So, but I see that in India, at least we are evolving, we are uh, improving, ethics committees have improved to quite an extent and a lot of them have started doing uh, some kind of monitoring in one way or the other. Most of the time it is through a written report. So they keep asking for continuing review reports, which they can, because the thing is ethics committees don't have that manpower to really go to the site and do a review, unless it is for cause or there are any complaints but uh, I suggest that, you know, in this pandemic, when we are doing everything electronically, they can electronically see informed consent process. You know, they could monitor a study uh, electronically as well and ask for reports. Um, in India, we do have a regulation where, where uh, vulnerable populations are involved in a certain kind of regulatory studies. Video recording is required for the informed consent process. So that, that is a regulatory requirement and the ethics committee has to make an assessment whether a particular study would require a, a recording of the informed consent process. So these are some of the things, but yeah, we are a long way to go from what we actually want to do. Thank you. Go, I think Rafaela, you wanted to add something? Please go for it and then, then Maureen, Okay, <laughs> sorry, Maureen. No, I think it's a, this is an important point. And for many of us, this issue of the continuous oversight is a, a weak point, even outside the emergency context. And uh, just as a reflection, uh, I think we have to be careful that this doesn't become just a formal checks because ethics is, is about dialogue. And, often we get caught uh, in forms. <laughs> so the risk is that sometimes we receive an annual report, somebody is checking against a, a checklist and we put a stamp and we said the approval is, and this is more formal than substantial. So it would be much more interesting if you have the time to have the possibility to meet the researcher, to say, how is it going? Ali, to make this really meaningful and not just a formal check. And this is a, um, quite uh, perhaps a challenge for, for many at this committee. There was also a couple of years ago, a nice present, a nice publication from um, uh, Angus Dawson and Donald Matuna and others who were even proposing a retrospective uh, ethics review that it will be nice to make a review of the study once it has been completed to see which were the challenges actually uh, met uh, and uh, how we can uh, address this in the future. But of course, uh, this uh, uh, requires uh, a time and a big, big trust between researchers and ethics reviewers. Just wanted to make um, a quick point uh, in response to your question about social value and prediction and studies that don't um, deliver on, on the social value. And I think it's so important in the context of, of the pandemic in particular to underscore the social value of negative findings. Um, so with hydroxychloroquine and a number of, of um, findings where um, you know there was significant social value in learning 
um, that something is inefficacious uh, when it was hoped that it would be efficacious amongst um, interventions that we had on hand. Um, so I think that those trials were really valuable. And um, so social value, uh, you know, we don't have a crystal ball at the stage of ethics review. At the outset, we're looking at the rigor of the design and is it going to answer definitively um, in one direction or another on, on, on efficacy. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that, you know, we need fairly open-minded about the science um, when, we, when we assess social value. Um, but in the case of, of a pandemic and rapidly evolving science, uh, it's worth you know, underscoring the importance of, of negative findings as well. Thank you, uh, Maureen. And talking about crystal balls, because I think this is what we all wanted to have during the pandemic, um, we also have seen um, the, the many, many little studies that do very similar work and committees have to read many, many similar studies that could have been put together, could have been uh, uh, integrated in a larger effort that would, you know, allow investigators to achieve the results faster, made the work of the committees easier and really maximize uh, um, catalyze our capacity to, to find out the, the answers to the key burning questions. What mechanisms can we, uh, um, can, can you propose for that type of integration of efforts in that, you know, having the best, the, 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 um, the, the scientifically stronger studies being the one that uh, get started uh, faster. I'm, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we've had some discussions about uh, perhaps having a, about what role, if any, ethics review committees could have in this because of the really marginal social value of very little studies. And uh, perhaps we should have some sort of letter of intent, some sort of uh, early communication for, from researchers to committees saying, hey, by the way, we're working on this. Or, or some platform for studies in the work to be shared between researchers and committees and national authorities. Any thoughts about that? I think we have to be really as creative as possible with challenges like this. Uh, on my side, oh, sorry, Rolly, please go. Ahead. Okay, it's, uh, I mean, I. I agree with you, uh, Carla. This is what we have been seeing uh, a lot, small pieces of studies, studies similar to each other. Here, I think there is another stakeholder who should um, help, uh, and the, these are the uh, donors, funders of research, particularly in the beginning of the epidemics, you have had a big number of big or small funder uh, uh, launching a course for research in COVID. And these have, this was positive, but was fragmented and has in turn stimulated fragmentation of the research. So I think ethics committee should perhaps uh, join forces for advocating for a, a less fragmented and more uh, uh, yeah, collaborative approach to research, but we would really need also have other players, particularly external funders, to, to play the game. Thank you so much, Rafael. I think that's a very important final point to end our discussion because it's already 9 a.m. for me uh, here in Washington, D.C. I think it's uh, we, we have to keep thinking about how to do things better and how to bring all the relevant people to the table to collaborate and come up with uh, solutions. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you to our great panelists today. Thank you to the World Health Organization and the Global Health Network for this initiative. The session has been recorded and it will be posted at the Epidemic Ethics uh, Seminar page. And we also invite you to check that website to uh, learn about future seminars. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.